Doomsday is I own uh, Doomsday Armory. It's a website and uh, we sell body armor and plate carriers and all that. And uh, I actually shut my site down, uh, took it off the internet to go out there and didn't bring any inventory or anything. And I had a lot of people get really upset because they needed stuff. But um, you know, I didn't want to go out there as a business ploy. Um, you know, I could have sold everything I had probably five times over. And, um, <laughs> you know, it was nice to, to get home and basically I'm redoing my entire website and uh, the support that I've gotten nationwide from guys that I've met out there and women I've met out there is outstanding. Um, so that's where Doomsday came from. Josh is my uh, is my middle son, and he was the most trouble out of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I gotta tell you, is uh, is uh, uh, he's the only one that went, and I didn't have to ask. Uh, matter of fact, there was huge personal sacrifice for a lot of these people. They lost wives out of this deal. They lost children who won't talk to them. Lost brothers and sisters who won't yep. talk to them. Yep. They lost jobs, uh, and there and there's these stories times a hundred, maybe a thousand, that went on. And, uh, but these people, uh, all of these guys, uh, stepped up to that call. So when you read that, that last line in the Declaration of Independence, is where they, they gave <coughs> their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Now, these people all have paid some of that price. And we all, I know personally for myself, have a, have a full understanding of what it was and, what, and why they actually put those words in at the end of the, our Declaration of Independence. It's like, I read it and, and I, I kind of understood it, but I never felt it. And, uh, and after this event, as I certainly, and while at this event, I certainly felt it. And I know all of these people did as well, because it was at a huge cost. Uh, if anybody is hiring help, please let me know because some of these guys could use some work and, uh, and uh, would appreciate that because we want to keep these people taken care of, uh, certainly, because these are the people that are going to stand up and, and defend your freedoms and defend our freedoms and the freedoms of those who can't stand up and, uh, and, some, and unfortunately there are of some who won't stand up. And, uh, and I know you guys are all patriots in this crowd, because I know all of you, and, uh, and God bless all of you. I do, uh, uh, I just can't say enough about all of them, I gotta tell you. Is the conditions out there were horrid, they were dry, uh, dusty, windy, every three days it'd blow like mad, it collapsed our camp a number of times, the tents wouldn't stand up, except for mine. <laughs> My mondo condo, if you buy a tent, buy the mondo condo. Uh, but uh, most, most, a lot of them were just flat. Uh, all of our firearms were full of, full of sand and, and grit. Our, so it was about everything except for Kenny taking care of the food, and, uh, which he did. I gotta tell you, I don't know how he pulled it off. Did such an outstanding job in that kitchen, uh, him and Ashley. And, and, I mean, everybody had jobs here. Coop taking care of, uh, of, uh, of the rally. He, he was going, I don't know, 20 hours and all. He almost had a breakdown at one point. He, he just kept going and going and going, would not stop. Of course, he had a beard then, so he didn't look like such the baby. <laughs> yesterday. But uh, there, there are unsung heroes. We had Navy SEALs out there. We had uh, Army Rangers. We had a Korean War veteran out there. Who was in his 80s, and uh, and that guy stood guard duty for for oh god, I don't know how many hours. He'd stand a 12-hour shift in guard duty. Uh, and and the story is, is 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 he was coming out of his tent and he fell. And, uh, and the guys asked them if they could help him. Mind you, this guy's in his 80s. And, uh, and, it, uh, and when they asked him I wanted to help, he said, oh, I'm just practicing my prone position. <laughs> uh, was just the, the, the hearts of lions. I'm telling you, the hearts of lions. And on that gentleman, he only lived 15 miles away, so he could have gone home and still been close enough if all hell broke loose. Stay right right there. As far as I know, he's still camped out there. Yeah, I'd like to say one other thing about him. Um, he was the only member of the Southern Nevada militia that showed up. Wow. The only really? one. That's and true. he went against the orders of that Nevada's commander. Female. And came anyway. No offense. Um, <laughs> what, uh, well, needs to kick her out. what they required uh, was a letter from Clive and Bundy asking for their aid. For them to defend their own. Their, their and own Clive and wouldn't write the letter because he felt that they're the Southern Nevada Militia, this is your state too, 
and he was the only one that showed up. And wow. he was actually 78 years old, and that guy, you could not stop him. Mm -hmm. Is uh, you know that was an issue that we had out there, being as short manned as we were, um, and a bunch of observation posts, guard details, all that. Is um, I mean I was personally awake for 30 hours at a time sometimes and um, you know you'd get a couple hours of sleep here or there and right back at it and I didn't hear one person complain no, not one of these guys or some of the other guys that were there as well as uh, we had a job to do and they would just do it and uh, you know it was a huge honor for me to, to be with these guys and know that no matter what was going to happen there is uh, they had my back and everybody in that camp and um, you know they they all deserve a round of applause um, from the entire nation yeah. and if this happens again you know remember these faces because they'll be there again mm -hmm. uh, y'all to know that I'm sure we've all heard that the Oath Keeper organization had pulled out on a drone strike and as uh, Cooper stated he was one of the youngest ones there um, on the night of the drone strike we had had during that day a father and son standing post for 10 or 12 hours because the organization of Oath Keepers had pulled out and left us extremely undermanned that father and son remained on post all night long until the next day. The son was 14 years old, standing there armed with us. Wow. We had, uh, we had yes, hus husbands and wives there who had never fired a firearm, never owned one, didn't have one there, and they stayed. Uh, who was that woman, Marie? And, uh, Maria? Yeah, Maria. We had a gal there, Maria, who had just become an American citizen two weeks prior to, and as she stood post, she's German, and I gotta tell you, what a woman. Unbelievable. Yes, what sir. an absolute patriot. She put most men I know, and I'm a former Marine, I'm telling you, to shame. Unbelievable. And uh, she, uh, she stood her post, would not waver. When the, uh, I'm just going to go into a little bit about that, that drone strike, is, uh, is because there was some information. Is, uh, is there was, uh, uh, Stuart Rhodes, the head of those keepers, got a tip on a tip line. He had some phones set up that uh, there was a, a drone strike that was going to hit our camp and also hit the Bundy residence. Now, and a few that tip is, is the word was is that uh, uh, Eric Holder had signed the authorization for a drone strike on us. Mind you, we had already seen snipers up on the hills uh, uh, prior to this that had been put in placements uh, 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 behind us. But the drone strike was, uh, was uh, I mean, it, it was, you had to give it some attention because it was a threat. Uh, and we know our government's out of control, but we weren't panicked. And uh, because we didn't really think, I personally didn't really think they'd pull it off because I just thought it was too off the wall. American people behind us, even if they did kill every one of us, is that uh, it would be such an outrage to America that, uh, that uh, everybody would, would stand at that point. Which is uh, part of the part part of the reason why we were out there is we thought that if in fact uh, the American government did attack us in one way or form or another and decimate us because they certainly would have but we would have gave them a bloody nose in the process is that uh, it would have rallied America to stand up finally to stand for their constitutional rights and recognize what's going on with this country uh, and its move towards tyranny because we are in tyranny is uh, so the drone strike. Uh, uh, tip. I listened to it actually on the phone talking to the guy who called it in from Texas to Stuart Rhodes and, uh, and I asked the guy a couple of questions <clears throat> and uh, naturally anybody who calls that in is going to have some type of answer. So Stuart sent a guy in from uh, Texas, uh, it was, I believe it was Dallas, who lived over there and to talk to this fellow. And uh, so he went and interviewed him and uh, then came back and reported back to Stuart and I, which I had complete control of the entire camp. I was a camp commander and also all the outside security for teams uh, for the Bundys. There was another small group called the Minutemen who do a lot of the border watching who were outside of that, but we, we would work together. And then there was a small contingent, usually about six people, that stayed at the Bundy Ranch that gave private security to the Bundys. But the rest of that was really actually ended up under my purview, which was uh, God's will, I suppose. And uh, so uh, the uh, uh, 
<coughs> when when the uh, Stuart we when we got uh, talked to the uh, fellow who went and did the, the uh, debrief on this fellow who gave this uh, <coughs> this uh, word on the drone strike is uh, he he gave the guy like a six to seven. Well, I had no idea who any of these people were. Even the guy giving the debrief uh, was all on the phone. Stuart knew this one guy, and uh, that it was a six to seven uh, out of ten that this was uh, factual. And he said, the guy said, I can't confirm it completely because I need another source, and there was no other source. So, which uh, there were a lot of oath keepers, probably about half of our forces were oath keepers, and uh, which you would expect, and, uh, and some great guys, and, and gals as well. So, Stewart uh, uh, had left the camp because he'd come in and out. He'd go on more buying sprees than anything. He'd come in and out, and he was staying at a hotel in. Uh, in uh, Mesquite, I believe, at the time. <coughs> and uh, so uh, he, he, what he wanted to do is, is warn the Bundys that, uh, of this, uh, of this <coughs> attack that Stuart thought it was imminent, and I didn't. I said, well, we should go let him know, and I knew the head of the security, this fellow named Buddha, so, so well, we'll just drive up and we'll let Buddha know and uh, give him a heads up, because the Bundys weren't leaving. If, if there was 100% assurity they were going to get hit with the drone, they wouldn't have left, they would have stayed. And uh, that was their ranch, and nobody's blowing them off of it. And uh, uh, so uh, we went up. And I told told Buddha what's going on. Buddha said, "Okay, all right, great." Because we've heard so many rumors before, and I was pretty rumor worn out by rumors. But you, you have to give it some credibility. Just <coughs> so what I told Stuart I was going to do is move our people out of the camp, up onto the onto, onto the ridges that overlook our camp, to get them out of out of the immediate area. So. So Stuart was fine with that. He was going to set up some roving patrols. They had had some new guys with new ham radios, and they were going to cruise down the highway. So he needed like about eight guys to do that, which he had, not counting those keepers we had at the camp. And uh, so I went down. Uh, the, the Bundys were having an event, a barbecue, and an event across the river uh, from from the camp. And uh, I went down there to uh, actually run security and go down there and and actually. Uh, Co-mingle with them and also offset some of the press down there. So I was down there and I got a call. I don't know. I was down there about an hour. I had a chance to finally eat some Bundy beef. I got a call that uh, I needed to get back to camp immediately on my radio because we're using uh, small hams, ham radios. And uh, so I sh I came back to the camp. By the time I got back to the camp, is almost we had probably all but five of our oath keepers were gone, and uh, the, the posts were all stripped. The, the security team that was up at the buddies that were the oath keepers that we had at the gate, those guys were gone. And, wow. uh, so we lost probably, I don't know, maybe 50 guys, I think, or maybe 50 or 60 guys. It took them like 10 minutes to get out of there. And what had happened, I wasn't there, but what happened is, is Stuart Rose had panicked. And that's the simple truth of it, is he panicked and, uh, and he sent two guys into the camp against orders and asked them to, and told all the oath keepers they needed to, to get out of camp and, and have a, and meet him at a hotel in the Mesquite. And uh, so some of the oath keepers who left had no idea why they were going. And, uh, and I don't want to say that those oath keepers were bad guys because they were all pretty good guys. And, uh, uh, but, uh, but they followed Stewart's command, which split the command, which was already agreed upon that wouldn't happen, which is a terrible field position to be in. So. Well, what I had to do at that point is then take the people that we had left and try to cover all the bases. So I had to send more people down to first to make sure the bunnies were safe, uh, and then uh, and then also then to take care of the camp. So uh, uh, that's what we did. And I sat down and and uh, 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 Kenny made coffee. So I sat and we sat sat in the middle of the camp. And I drank coffee all night in the middle of the camp, waiting for the drones. <laughs>